September 14th saw the release of writer and director Shane Black's The Predator, a movie which was intended to restart the Predator franchise and to spawn two direct sequels. I emphasize was intended in the past never tense, because that ain't happening. The movie earned just shy of 25 million in its opening weekend and no stived in its second weekend. After two weeks in release, the worldwide box office stands at about 100 million. That growth will of course grow in the weeks to come, but not by much, all things considered. To be clear, these earnings would have been fine if the studio had capped the budget at, say, 40 million tops. But instead, they spent 88 million. That they will admit to, because due to extensive reshoots, the actual cost will have been much higher than that. It is because of that expenditure that these box office numbers are franchise ending. So how could The Predator, a sequel to one of the greatest action movies of the 80s, and therefore of all time, have come to this? In this postmortem, I will uncover just that by first exploring why the original is such a beloved classic, and then use that as the baseline for comparison with a new movie. That way, I'll explore the filmmakers, the script, the tone and the cast, and finally, my thoughts on and recommendations for the future of the franchise. Despite the somewhat mixed reception at the time, as we covered in our earlier mini-documentary on all things Predator, the original Predator has stood the test of time, and today stands as one of the greatest action movies ever made. It is arguably one of the better Schwarzenegger movies, and I believe it has to the test of time because it was executed with perfection in all areas. The script was tight, focused, and didn't have any excess weight. The tone was spot on. We call it an action movie because it had Schwarzenegger, and by all means, there is action in it. But tonally, the movie is very much so a thriller. It was all about tension, atmosphere, and suspense. It was about hiding, trying to evade a vastly superior enemy. It was about uncovering the mystery of who or what that enemy was. The cast was a good mix of established talent and relative newcomers. Not everyone in the cast were necessarily great actors in their own right, but they were given roles which fit their various skill sets and personalities perfectly, and the results of that came across on screen. They were a brotherhood, and they didn't need to tell the audience that they were. It was felt through the words not spoken. And the Predator himself? A mere plot device. A good one, in no small part because of Stan Winston's design, but a mere plot device nonetheless. I believe the original movie stands out the way it does not because of the Predator per se, but because of its atmosphere, tone and cast. All the ingredients came together in a perfect blend, which turned out a flawless, memorable movie. The later Predator movies all had more Predator action than the original one ever did, but those other ingredients, the tone, the cast, the suspense, have never successfully been repeated, although the makers of Predator 2 and Predators, to their credit at the very least, tried, just not hard enough, as they went in other directions. So, when Shane Black, who both co-wrote and co-starred in the original Predator, was appointed director of the new one, many hoped that he would see what other filmmakers had missed and make Predator great again. It was even his express desire to make the movie an event-like blockbuster that would elevate the series once again. Clearly, that didn't happen. Let's look at why. Since co-writing and co-starring in the original Predator, Shane Black has written such movies as among others Lethal Weapon, The Last Action Hero, and The Monster Squad, alongside its director Fred Decker. And he has both written and directed Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, Iron Man 3, and The Nice Guys, which I personally find to be criminally underrated. Oh, and about Iron Man 3. I know a lot of you have issues with that movie, but don't hold that too much against him. Like on all other Marvel movies, Kevin Feige is the Uber director, and he allowed all of that to happen. The guy gets credit for making Marvel movies what they are, and rightfully so. But let's not give him a free pass for the things that he could have stopped, but didn't. That aside, what should be clear from Shane Black's past catalogue is that his thing is action comedy. 
writing-wise. He specializes in witty and wise-cracking bro moments between male characters, so I'm inclined to believe that his writing contributions to the original Predator were restricted to his own character's jokes and the awkward silences that follow them, plus maybe one or two more character moments like that. That worked fine in the original Predator, because director John McTiernan was on hand to ensure that any humor and wisecracking present fit in with and added to the suspenseful tone the movie was going for. On this movie, John McTiernan wasn't there to ensure tonal consistency. Instead, Shane Black turned to Fred Decker to help him write The Predator. Fred Decker, of course, is the director of Monster Squad, a movie which Shane Black helped co-write. Fred Decker hasn't directed another movie since the absolute travesty that was Robocop 3, a movie which he co-wrote with comic book legend Frank Miller. Or more accurately, his writing further butchered the already bad outline by Frank Miller into something even worse. Since then, he has done some uncredited script doctoring on movies like Demolition Man and Lethal Weapon 4, and written some episodes of Star Trek Enterprise. So, what kind of script did Messieurs Black and Decker come up with? The script actually leaked online as early as 2016, and the verdict was that it was a pretty bad one, and more or less what you see on screen in the finished movie. Where the original Predator had a tight and to the point linear script with no excess flubber of any kind, Black and Decker script was so sprawling and disjointed that whole plot lines and additional characters were filmed but had to be removed in editing, because whatever they may have added was offset by a cluttered narrative and out of control running time. Note that I am not talking about the scene featuring director Shane Black's buddy, Steven Wilder Striegel. That scene had him hitting on Olivia Munn's character, who was introduced in that scene, and so was her affection for dogs. This scene was intended to be in the released movie, but was cut by Fox Decree after Olivia Munn discovered that Striegel is a registered sex offender, which she became after having sent sexually explicit and suggested emails to a minor. The scenes that were cut to bring the movie's running time under control featured Edward James Olmos' character, who initially had a relatively significant role. Whenever a whole character or subplot is cut, it means the movie went into production with a script that needed more work, much more. This is not unique, however. Plenty movies enter production with a script nowhere near done, meaning it needs to be rewritten on the fly, or the filmmakers need to improvise a lot more than usual during the shoot, or that the final movie will be whatever they can cobble together in editing. And to be clear, some great movies have been made that way. My go-to example is First Blood, the original Rambo movie, which was intended to be and filmed as a long, drawn-out, slow-paced drama with a little bit of action here and there for good measure. In the editing bay, they found out that didn't work and cut out nearly two hours worth of footage. In so doing, the movie was tonally transformed from a slow and boring mess that Stallone feared would destroy his career into a haunting action drama classic, which demonstrated there was much more to Stallone than just Rocky. But that was an exception rather than the rule. As a general thing, especially on movies with budgets like these, it is advisable to ensure that the script doesn't have too much excess fat before production begins. It is far better to cut away redundant material already in the scripting stage, rather than giving yourself extra challenges in the editing bay. Case in point, I'm pretty sure the extensive reshoots must have been at the very least partially about creating new connective tissue for when major chunks intended to be in the movie had to be taken out. In the end though, regardless of how and at what stage it is arrived at, the finished movie will live and die not just by its story, but by its tone. As established earlier, the original Predator was for all its action, a thriller. The tone was one of sustained suspense throughout, and all the violence, gore, and strategic humor at key moments all added to that suspenseful tone, which I believe is vital for understanding that movie's longevity. Instead of delivering suspense, Shane Black's The Predator brought humor and quirkiness. That worked in The Nice Guys, it works in Marvel movies, but in my opinion, it did not work here. The excessive humor and wisecracking undermined any suspense 
and ironically, the gore undermined the humor. The movie tried to be fun, it tried to be exciting, and it tried to be gory, but out of those three, it could only have pulled off two at the same time. In trying to be all three, it ended up a tonal mess that wasn't fun, that wasn't exciting, and where the gore had no impact. But in addition to story and tone, the original also holds up for its ensemble cast. How does the new one measure up in this regard? The cast in the original had very few lines, but every line mattered, every word and every expression was impactful. By contrast, the cast in the new one are a bunch of clowns that never shut up, and almost every line out of their mouths is a stupid one. The character interaction may not be quite Paul Feig's Ghostbusters bad, but Black and Decker are no Tarantinos, to put it mildly. I'm not saying the cast are bad actors, outside of maybe one or two that is, but they were given a crap script and garbage dialogue to work with, and for that reason, the cast didn't work. But beyond the script not being complete, the tone being a mess, and the cast not working, the movie had another major problem. It was so unbelievably stupid. I haven't said much about the screen story so far, so let's get into spoiler territory to explore some moments where the movie lost me, and I think a whole lot of others. We follow Floyd Holbrook's character, McKenna, a military sniper who is on a mission when a predator conveniently crash lands in his immediate vicinity. McKenna takes it upon himself to steal some of the Predator's equipment, and sends it, by post, to his own P.O. box. Conveniently, he hasn't paid the bills for the service, so it is instead sent to his home and opened by his autistic son. The son's autism conveniently enables him to immediately grasp Predator technology, which will be very convenient later on, and it allows for Predator action to take place in suburbia so Black & Decker obviously learn nothing from AVPR. Anyway, McKenna is taken in for questioning, and instead of playing it smart and denying he saw any aliens, or being honest and saying he did see aliens, but he's already in Black Ops, so they might as well recruit him from that to whatever anti-alien operation they got going, he decides to be a total ass about it, and gets himself locked up. He is sent on a bus with other soldiers that have cracked, which was conveniently passing by, they instantly bond, and are conveniently driving by the facility where the crashed Predator is being held in captivity. This is a special facility, essentially Area 51, dedicated to the Predators. As it will turn out much later in the movie, this particular Predator is a rogue Predator, one that takes issue with his home planet's long-term plan of invading our planet and he intends to help humanity by bestowing us with a precious gift. This means that what this predator is looking for are humans that ideally already know who his people are and the threat they represent, someone in power who can actually make a difference, and who have the necessary skill set to appreciate and make proper use of the gift he intends to bestow on humanity. In other words, he is looking for just such a facility like the one where he's being held, and he is looking for just the kind of scientists he is surrounded by. Instead of waking up and thinking, Jackpot, I'm here! That was easy. Let's try communicating with all these people who are dying to talk to me. He inexplicably decides to kill them all and escape. In the aftermath of the Predator's escape, the military inexplicably decides that Olivia Munn's character, who they themselves called in for help, must be eliminated, giving her a reason to go with the Lunibin bus that conveniently shows up. Later, a giant-sized Super Predator arrives on the scene, and he brought his Predator hunting dogs with him. After being shot in the head, one of these dogs becomes lobotomized in such a way that it acts like a dog as we know it. Aww. Black and Decker must not have seen Ang Lee's Hulk, because the Predator dogs were as badass, maybe even worse than the Hulk dogs. The movie is filled with references to the previous Predator movies, and many more were added in the reshoots. Sadly, most of them are merely repeating lines, iconography, environments, and even injuries from previous movies. These are meta-references, wink-wink moments to the audience, reminding us that we are seeing a movie, and there are so many of these references, so in your face, and so distracting that it honestly took me out of the movie. 
through it all. There is this subplot about the predators augmenting themselves with DNA from captured prey, and about the proverbial next step in evolution. This way, Black and Decker, like so many of their Hollywood peers, clearly demonstrate that they don't really understand evolution. Finally, there is the gift from the rogue predator, the weapon which will defend us from all the other predators. An Iron Man suit. No, for real, it's an Iron Man suit with a predator theme, so let's call it an Iron Predator. Yeah, I'm sure we can learn a lot from retroengineering it, but honestly, we'd be better off with a textbook from their engineering school than with one Iron Predator. How is that going to save us from invasion, even if Floyd Holbrook's McKenna is the one wearing that one suit? Oh yeah, because despite the military wanting to kill him earlier, and him having caused untold damage to the anti-predator program, he is for some incomprehensible reason back in their good grace and in a position of power no less, just like that. Anyway, on the surface, it doesn't seem like one Iron Predator would make that big a difference. Maybe Black & Decker would have told us what was so game-changing about it in the sequel. But again, that's would have in the past never tense, because there isn't going to be a sequel, which honestly I don't mind, as I didn't like this one. Someone else who didn't like it, at least at the script stage, was Arnold Schwarzenegger, who was offered a cameo as Dutch Schaefer from the original. A cameo which easily could have been swapped with another character from any of the other movies. That's with how little care the role was written. While the movie was still in production, Schwarzenegger told Yahoo Movies that. They asked me, and I read it, and I didn't like it. Whatever they offered. So I'm not going to do that, no. Except if there's a chance that they rewrite it, or make it a more significant role. But the way it is now, no, I won't do that. In the end, they didn't rewrite it, and Arnold didn't do it. Good choice, Arnie. Good choice. To replicate the success of the original Predator, which honestly is the only Predator that was legitimately successful, it is my opinion that you need to repeat the core elements which made it successful in the first place. These were a tight, no-nonsense script, a consistent and suspenseful tone, and a cast which fit the tone and the story they were going for. I believe the Predator can be successful again, but only in the hands of a director who will take the same basic approach to these core elements as John McTiernan did with the original. Shane Black wasn't the guy. Just because he was there and made some minor contribution to the original does not mean he has the skill set to carry on the torch. It should have been obvious to the powers that be at Fox that if they hire action comedy specialist Shane Black for Predator, he is going to deliver them an action comedy, and that is the last thing the Predator franchise needed. It should have been obvious, but it wasn't. So here we are, doing the postmortem. As we established in the beginning, the box office numbers the Predator is getting are franchise ending. This movie won't be getting a sequel. However, I do believe the Predator will be back at some point in the future for two reasons. One is that thanks to the longevity of the original, and the comics, and the games, and the alien connection, there is an audience for the Predator. It might not be a huge audience by blockbuster standards, but if one keeps costs under control, there is great earning potential there. The other is that Predator, alongside Alien, is owned wholesale by Fox and the Fox movie division will, by all accounts, soon be owned by Disney. One way or the other, Disney will find a way to capitalize on the brand, whether through the Fox label or another one to be made to feature the many more adult-oriented properties Disney will also get in the Fox merger. Wherever and whenever the Predator shows up next, I hope they will go with a tight story, a consistent and suspenseful tone, and a cast to match. I'd also be all in favor of seeing Schwarzenegger return as Dutch Schaefer, not just in a cameo, but in a major role. That at least is my hope and recommendation, but I'd also like to hear what you think, so please share your opinion on Black & Decker's The Predator, and your hopes for the future of the franchise in the comments. If you like this video, then please click the subscribe button. And don't forget to click the bell icon to be notified for all the latest uploaded content, due to recent changes to YouTube's monetization policies. 
We'd also like to ask you to please consider supporting Midnight's Edge and its sister channel, Midnight's Edge After Dark, through Patreon. As thanks for their support, patrons will receive early notifications of mini documentaries, special behind the scenes making of the Edge videos, bloopers, outtakes, lost episodes, and more. You can support the channel for as little as $1 a month. Be sure to check back for news and analysis on the corporate politics behind your favorite genre movies, as well as updates and discussion here at Midnight's Edge.